Welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. I've said it zero times before and I'll say it again, I don't trust robots. I just know they're out to get me. They walk up to me while I'm at the farmer's market and ask me to sign their petition, so I start chucking cabbages at them to get their metal pincers away from me, and yet I'm the one who gets the restraining order? But a man can only appear in court so many times before he starts to uh, let his guard down. Maybe there are some robots out there who are trying to do good in the world. What would convince me? I don't know, they could say around the world 144 times. Today, we're talking about Daft Punk. Let's dive in. Our computerized chronicle begins in 1987 at the Lycée Carnot in Paris, France. It was here where two young boys met and became friends, Guy Manuel Duhomem Cristo and Thomas Bongalder. Their helmets looked a lot different back then. They bonded over their love of music and movies, Chicago House, Detroit Techno, The Day the Earth Stood Still, Brian De Palma's Phantom of the Paradise. As their first musical project, they teamed up with their friend Laurent Bronkowitz to form Darlin in 1992. From all accounts, they were a decent, if unremarkable, indie rock band. Guy Manuel and Thomas would later refer to Darlin as, quote, pretty average, a sentiment shared by the UK music magazine Melody Maker. You see, two of Darlin's songs made it onto a compilation, and a review of said songs by the publication called their music a thrash. But not just any thrash, a punky thrash. But not just any punky thrash, a daft punky thrash. Eventually, Guy Manuel and Thomas split from Darlin to explore new genres of music, while Laurent went off with his brother to join another band. Maybe we'll run into him again. Who knows? Their first single under the melodiously made moniker Daft Punk was The New Wave in 1994, though you might know the final mix better, which was named Alive. The track was released through Soma Quality Recordings as the duo had met the label's founder at a rave at Euro Disney. Their next song was Defunk. How remarkable is it that Daft Punk nailed their core sound with just their second song? It's like, oh yeah, the first kid we had was all right, no big deal or whatever, but that second kid, oh, that's where it's at. The punch of the kick drum, the tightness of the rhythm section, the clarity of the bass line, the immediate catchiness of the main hooks, a lot of what makes Daft Punk work is in this song. The public agreed too, Defunk became a pretty big hit thanks to its music video, directed by a young Spike Jones, getting a ton of airplay on MTV. And it led Daft Punk to get a new manager, Pedro Winter, a new label, Virgin Records, and a new production company, Daft Tracks. It was through that company that Daft Punk signed their record deal with Virgin, which allowed them to keep the rights to their master recordings. And so, the Definitely Still Humans began recording more songs from Tomas' home studio. Their work from home eventually gave us homework in January 1997. Homework has the benefit of having the lowest stakes of any Daft Punk album. The duo made these tracks without thinking much about album sequencing or anything like that. The opening trio of songs gives the impression that there might be some greater theme to the record, but that impression leaves pretty quickly. So yes, Homework is just a collection of songs without much cohesion. That said, it's still a pretty good collection of songs. Here's something that I never see Daft Punk praised for. Pacing. Revisiting their albums has made me appreciate how great they are at keeping your attention with how and when new musical motifs enter. It reminds me of how people praise Mario games. They introduce an idea, then spend a level elaborating on that idea. A great example is Around the World. Now, you may have already thought of a wicked joke about how the robot man says the title 80 times in the radio edit and 144 on the album version. And hey, it's a funny joke. I'm proud of you, kiddo. But let's take a moment to understand why this song became the biggest hit off Homework. The amount of separate musical ideas in this song could be counted on two hands, but when Daft Punk introduce a new idea, they give it 8 or 16 measures to get you accustomed to it, and the next time you hear it, it might be paired with a new bass line, or a low-pass filter thrown on, or a guy saying around the world over it. The sense of progression is clearly defined, and I never feel like I'm bored or lost. The music video gets this too. It was directed by Michel Gondry, and it has each group of dancers representing a part of the mix. To this day, it's still one of my favorite music videos. Other songs on the album nail the sense of progression as well. Fresh, Phoenix, High Fidelity. Also, shout out to teachers where Daft Punk themselves shout out musical figures who served as an inspiration to them, such as American DJs Todd Edwards and Romanthony. It'd be cool to see Daft Punk work with them. Of course, no debut is perfect. While most of Homework's tracks are engaging over a long runtime, some don't hold up. I'm not too fond of Rollin' and Scratchin' or Rock and Roll. They're both centered around these bursts of noise, and they get annoying after a few minutes. I suppose I could also ding the whole album for being repetitive, but 
th this is house music, it's kind of the point of house music to be structurally repetitive so that the rhythms and melodies burrow their way into your skull and keep you dancing until the sun comes up. The songs may not work as well if you're listening like Benelok Cumberholms, but put them on at a party or in the gym and they'll do what needs to be done. All in all, Homework is a good album and a pretty remarkable debut. Daft Punk's Homework passes with flying colors. Homework was daft and punky, but it definitely wasn't a thrash. Critics enjoyed it a good deal, as did the general public. And in the years since, Homework and its singles have become defining works of 90s French house. Guy Manuel and Thomas spent all of 1997 on their first worldwide tour, the Daft and Direct Tour. While they started the tour wearing their skin helmets, the growing attention around the two was starting to unnerve them. By the end, they were donning face masks and other random coverings. Once the tour ended, they spent time alternating between their next album and side projects. In particular, Thomas helped make two of the biggest French house songs of the late 90s. You know, as a side project. First was 1998's Music Sounds Better With You, made with fellow DJs Benjamin Diamond and Alan Brax under the name Stardust. Then there was 2000's Together, the self-titled debut single by Thomas and DJ Falcon. Both of these tracks are excellent and well worth a listen if you like Daft Punk. But Guy Manuel was also busy. He founded the French house label Cri in 1997, which he released music through in collaboration with co-owner Eric Chedeville, under the name Le Night Club. There was also the duo's first video release, a music video compilation called Daft, a story about dogs, androids, firemen, and tomatoes. Is that what it stands for? Leading up to their next album, Guy Manuel and Thomas were thinking more about their visual presentation. The masks and face coverings were starting to get tiresome, and they wanted a look that was truly their own, while alluding to the sci-fi glam theatricality of acts like Kraftwerk and Bowie. And so, in a 2001 magazine shoot, they debuted the look that would define find their visual branding for their entire career. Two sleek, futuristic helmets with wigs. Yeah, the first Daft Punk helmets had wigs on them, but they were taken off mere minutes before the photo shoot began. Could you imagine a world where Daft Punk kept the wigs on their helmets? The reason the robots gave for their new headwear was a sampler exploding in the studio on September 9th, 1999 at 9.09 p.m. Not only did the helmets give Daft Punk the anonymity they longed for, but it gave their music a greater theme for those listening to latch onto. For their second album, that theme was childhood, or at least the experience of childhood, and the feeling of something new around every corner to discover. And on that note, Discovery was released in February 2001. I mentioned earlier their skill with song pacing, but Discovery shows Daft Punk's skill of album pacing. They took the core fundamentals that they presented on homework and expanded not just the genres they worked in, but their song and album structures as well. One more time, what's left to say about this? Aside from all of the things that I'm about to say, Romanthony's classic vocal performance, those processed horns, that breakdown that basically is the song, that last one has slowly become my favorite part of the song. If you're at a party listening to it, it makes you stop and take in the good times with friends, and if you're alone, it makes you think back to the good times of old. Aerodynamic is built around these two sick guitar riffs, Digital Love and Something About Us are gorgeous ballads, Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger is another great showcase of the duo's pacing skills, the lyrics first being clearly presented and then being expanded upon, great for hand-based videos and body-based videos. It also shows the increase in vocoders on the album compared to homework, and I should mention this now, I love whenever Daft Punk use vocoders. They could slap a vocoder on someone breaking up with me, and I would still bob my head to it. But growing up, I've learned to appreciate the deep cuts more and more. Voyager is probably one of my top 10 favorite Daft Punk songs. There's just something in the way the beat drops. Feels like a new song every time I listen. Superheroes has one of the fiercest kick drums I've ever heard. There's no way I can listen to it without headbanging so hard that I throw myself across the room. It only took me 20 years to finally fall in love with Face to Face, that simple staccato electric guitar, the sample of electric light orchestra's Evil Woman, Todd Edwards' vocals, and the closer too long might be a meta commentary on how it's the longest song on the album, but once that sample of Maze's Runaway kicks up and Romanthony starts talking about how he knows I need it, hey, and he needs it too, all right. This thing could be an hour long and I'd still love it. By the way, you may have noticed these videos I've been playing are all similar in style. That's because they're from a film Daft Punk made with toy animation. It's called Interstellar 45, The Story of the Secret Star System. While there is a plot, there is no dialogue. The movie is pretty much just the album playing in full with animations of these blue aliens. Look, I'm not saying it's a ripoff. The animation looks good to this day, and if you want a visual experience to match the album, you can't do much better than this. And hey, it gives you a reason to listen to 
Discovery, which is, and I don't know if you can tell this by now, a stellar album. Over two decades since its release, this album still feels boundless, like there's something new to discover uh? with each listen. Discovery was another success for Daft Punk. Better sales than homework, higher critical reception at the time, one more time becoming their biggest hit for the next decade or so. It had all the cool kids claiming they were the first to play Daft Punk to the rock kids. Now, if you were lucky enough to pick up Discovery when it first dropped, you would have been given a membership card to the internet's hippest and hoppinest spot, Daft Club. The duo's own fan club, where they put out exclusive remixes and demos for about the next two years. The most noteworthy standalone release from the club was a live 1997, a live recording from the Daft and Direct Tour. But don't fret, the Daft Club releases were eventually compiled together in December 2003. My personal favorite cut is Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger, remixed by the Neptunes. Wouldn't it be cool if Daft Punk worked with these guys in the future? In between records, Guy Manuel and Toma did things. Yeah, in case it hasn't been made clear yet, these guys kept personal matters very close to the heart. Or in their case, Gears. Soma did some movie work for Gaspar Noy's Irreversible. He put out another song with Together, So Much Love to Give. The Robots also made a remix of Franz Ferdinand's Take Me Out. It's basically the same song, but with some heavy layers of distortion. A bit disappointing, but hey, it's not like it was a sign of things to come. When it came time to work on their next album, Daft Punk did what many bands do when following up a breakthrough album. Strip back and get Weird. This new album was recorded in two weeks and mixed in four. That's six weeks to make a new record in contrast to Discovery's two and a half years. And also in contrast to Discovery, Daft Punk played with a minimal collection of instruments. Two drum machines, two guitars, one vocoder, one eight track. My least favorite Dr. Seuss book. In March of 2005, Daft Punk released Human After All. I'll start by saying the following. The following. Next, I'd like to say I really like the idea of Daft Punk working with self made limitations. I'm fond of the idea that limitations set you free, and no matter the quality of the record, I gotta give props to the robots for trying something new. But At its worst, Human After All feels dour, incomplete, and repetitive. Now you might be saying, Mike, you defended repetition back with homework. You defended it there, why not here? Ah, but my dear Chauncey, you forget that I was defending structural repetition. The issue with Human After All is timbral repetition. Past Daft Punk songs had only a few musical elements, but it was how the duo played with them that kept repetitive feelings at bay. With Human After All, once an element is presented in the mix, that's usually how it is for the rest of the song. So for tracks like Prime Time of Your Life, the Brainwasher or Steam Machine, I'd make it maybe two minutes in before asking, is this it? Is this all the song is gonna be? Not helping the matter is the tone of the whole record. On the surface, Human After All tackles the perils of technology, media, and paranoia. Already a sour turn from the childlike whimsicality of Discovery. But if you asked the robots, well, you wouldn't have been able to because they didn't do any press for the album. They said this was to let the album stand on its own, but they did also say years later that this was the worst decision they had ever made in their careers. The only thing I fear more than a robot is a robot with the benefit of hindsight. But even with its weak spots, I can't bring myself to fully dislike Human After All. I do genuinely enjoy the opening title track. I think it has the best melody on the whole record. The vocoded hook on Technologic is a major highlight of the record. It's so immediately catchy. Three notes about robot rock. One, the riff is sick. Two, the sample is from Breakwater's release The Beast, which is also sick. And three, George Michael was almost on it. Yeah, Daft Punk sent George a bunch of demos with the hopes of him featuring on the album. That didn't pan out, but the demos did inspire George's 2002 song, Freak. And make love and emotion are not only welcome changes of pace with more natural sounding production, but they also work well as the halfway point and closer of the album, respectively. So, warts and all, I don't think Human After All is a bad album, and I admire Daft Punk for not resting on their creative laurels. But I should be honest, a huge reason why I don't hate on Human After All is because of what Daft Punk would do next. Sales for Human After All were all right, but critical reception was the lowest Daft Punk had seen so far, with many bashing the record's tone and repetition. I know it's silly to say in hindsight, but it almost felt like the duo were old news now. Daft Punk's playing at your house? No one cares, James Murphy of LCD Sound System. The robots needed to do something to win back the public, something crowd-pleasing that would overload the senses. 
So they made an experimental film. Daft Punk's Electroma debuted at the Cannes Film Festival in March 2006, a 72 minute film with no Daft Punk music whatsoever. It's all pretty normal as far as I can tell. In all honesty though, it's an interesting film. If you want to make up your own mind about it, it's readily available online. Reception was mixed, though it's gone on to become one of those midnight showing cult classics, just like The Room. In fact, some interpreted the ending as a hint that the duo would break up. Thankfully, that didn't end up happening. But Daft Punk were also working on something else an anthology collection. Music Volume 1 released the same month as Electroma. Along with tracks from the past three albums, there was the title track, which was the B-side to Defunk, and their mix of British singer Gabrielle's Forget About the World. The month after Electroma and Music Volume 1, the duo kicked off their second worldwide tour at Coachella 2006. Not only were they debuting a brand new live mix comprised of tracks from throughout their career, but they were also debuting a full-on light show synced with the music built around a giant pyramid. And I know I'm about to sound hyperbolic, but from all accounts, that show was legendary. This performance is now looked back on in the same way we look back on Live Aid, the Beatles at Shea Stadium, that one Lenny Kravitz concert in 2015. It has this aura of importance behind it, largely because there's no official full video of it. Tomas said this was intentional, as the amateur recordings were far more compelling than any official video could be. Their Coachella performance kicked off a run of shows that went from summer 2006 all the way to the very end of 2007. It was during one of those shows at Lollapalooza in August 2007 that the duo met the artist formerly known as Kanye West in person for the first time. Now, the three men were already well aware of each other. In fact, Ye had already gotten their permission to sample Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger for a song of his. And a month before Lollapalooza, Ye released that song, Stronger. It would take until October for that song to hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100. And the following month, in November 2007, Daft Punk released Alive 2007, an official recording of their Paris performance. I believe everyone has at least one little harmless conspiracy theory that they ascribe to, and this is mine. Daft Punk's entire discography was made for the sole purpose of making Alive 2007. I mean, how else can you make sense of how perfectly some of these songs go together? Here's an example. One More Time is in the key of D major, and Aerodynamic is in the key of B minor, which is D major's relative minor, and thus shares the same pitches. So when I first heard the One More Time melody laid on top of Aerodynamic with no pitch shifting needed, Needed, I was blown away by how blindingly obvious that mashup was. Around the world and harder, better, faster, stronger. Technologic with Busta Rhymes Touch It, which sample Technologic. Defunct with dashes of Daft and Direct brought in. There's just such an intrinsic joy hearing the robots tinker with their songs as if they're organically coming up with these mashups on the spot. Plus, you know how I said the Human After All tracks could feel incomplete? We'll put some tears in their eyes and call them Tom Cruise because Alive 2007 completes them. You know what Human After All was missing? Superheroes, that's what it was missing. What was Television Rules the Nation missing? Well, a tempo increase firstly, but also crescendo. Sea Machine goes well with Too Long, but they also stretch it out with this extended tempo increase, a masterful way to build tension that is released by the hook of Too Long Dropping. And I know I said I wasn't huge on Prime Time of Your Life or Brainwasher, but put them together with Rollin' and Scratchin' and Alive, and oh, <laughs> you got a stoogle. I know I've been gushing about Alive 2007, but I should say, I don't think it works unless you you know the songs already, like I wouldn't recommend you check this out first. But once you have Daft Punk's catalog up to this point under your belt, you are in for a treat. This is my personal favorite Daft Punk album. Alive 2007, both the tour and album, were rousing successes. The tour is often credited with a surge in EDM's popularity, which we would see the ripple effects of for the next few years. Doesn't hurt that they were also riding high off the success of Ye Stronger. They even got to perform it live with him at the 2008 Grammys. This would be the first of three excellent Grammys performances by the duo. The next two big projects for Daft Punk were the kind that remind you that the universe is perfectly in balance. First, in October 2009, the duo and their music were heavily featured in DJ Hero. The DJ based spin-off of Guitar Hero, complete with turntable controller and all. Honestly, the mixes from this game were pretty good. I'm bummed that they're not available in any official capacity. Second, at the 2009 San Diego Comic-Con, it was announced that Daft Punk would be writing the score for the upcoming Tron Legacy. But before the movie's release, we got a nice surprise. In October 2010, Daft Punk reunited with their former bandmate Laurent and made a surprise appearance at a show with Laurent's band. What a nice thing to do to support a friend's up-and-coming band as they they play Madison Square Garden? What band did Laurent join? 
Yeah, so the band Laurent joined right after Darlin was Phoenix, an alt-rock indie pop outfit that blew the heck up in the late 2000s with their album Wolfgang Amadeus Phoenix. You might know that record from songs like 1901 or Listomania. So if you are concerned about Laurent being the Pete Best of Daft Punk, do not worry, he's done quite well for himself. And man, to see them reunite at MSG, playing mashups of If I Ever Feel Better with Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger, and 1901 with Together and Human After All, wonderful stuff. Almost makes you forget that this would end up being Daft Punk's final, non-televised live performance. One other quick note, Pedro Winter ended his tenure as the duo's manager in 2008 to focus on his own label, Ed Banger Records. It's been instrumental in pushing artists like Breakbot, Sebastian, and Justice, who are probably Daft Punk's closest successors. Anyway, in December 2010, Daft Punk's score for Tron Legacy was released alongside the film. And they even got cameos in it too. Call them EA Sports, cause they're in the game. This score was the robot's first time working with a full orchestra. The orchestral tracks are fine, but surprise, surprise, the score is at its best at its most electronic. The Son of Flynn, The Game Has Changed, Solar Sailor, Sea of Simulation, each of these show how Daft Punk's sonic palette, when mixed with the expected orchestra, can translate well to the big screen. Though chances are you know this score best from the song Derezzed. And for good reason, it's the one track on here that could be a standalone Daft Punk track. That distorted synth hook would have fit just fine on Human After All. But honestly, the most noteworthy song on this score is one that didn't even make it onto the track list. Years after the movie came out, an unreleased track called Computerized leaked online. It was intended to be the big tie-in single for the movie, complete with a verse by Jay-Z. The version that leaked apparently isn't finished, and I get why they would have scrapped it, but still, interesting to see what could have been. Anywho, I don't think this is a soundtrack that stands on its own, but it works for the movie and a few tracks are worth checking out. I have no problem calling it the most memorable part of this film, aside from 2010's CGI Young Jeff Bridges, and when real Jeff Bridges says, Biodigital jazz, man. Daft Punk were working on new material once Alive 2007 ended, but put recording on pause to tackle the Tron soundtrack. And maybe it was their time working with a live orchestra that inspired the robots to use live musicians on their new material instead of sampling in digital instruments. That inspiration eventually snowballed until Daft Punk were basically making the kind of old school record that they themselves would have found and sampled. We're talking sessions in the biggest studios in the world. We're talking collaborations with chic frontman Niall Rogers and 80s disco pioneer Giorgio Moroder. We're talking recording tracks using both analog and digital methods and listening to see which they preferred. Just like The Room! Early in 2013, Guy Manuel produced the song Night Call off French producer Kavinsky's debut album. If the song name sounds familiar, you probably heard it over the opening credits of the movie Drive. Around the same time, he also announced Daft Punk's move from Virgin to Columbia Records, as well as a brief tease of new music. And oh boy, that tease soon grew into a smother. Billboards, TV commercials, Coachella advertisements, interviews with all the album's big collaborators. This felt like a rollout for a classic album. And we sure got a classic album with random access memories in May 2013. An album that has stood the test of time and remains a constant topic of discussion for any music fan. Right? Okay, I may be diving straight into the anecdotal pool here, but let me ask you, when's the last time you listened to Random Access Memories? Heck, when's the last time you thought about it? You might say you haven't thought about it because it's been so long since it came out, but Kanye West's Yeezus came out the same month, and I still see plenty of people talking about that one. Which is funny, because Daft Punk produced some of the songs on Yeezus. This might just be me, but Ram feels like this strange phenomenon where it took up our lives for an entire year, and now it just feels like it never happened. On that note, when's the last time you heard Get Lucky, the album's main single? The closest thing Daft Punk had to a number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100. Oh yeah, Get Lucky never got to number one because of another song featuring Pharrell Williams. And you know what? I still hear blurred lines once in a blue moon when I'm out shopping. Somehow, this song is more present in our lives today than Get Lucky. I'm honestly a bit peeved about it because full disclosure here, Get Lucky is probably my favorite hit pop song of the 2010s. In the lead up to and aftermath of Get Lucky's release, I ate the song up. 
I watched on loop the song's debut on French radio. I watched on loop the Coachella ad with the gang playing a brief snippet. I watched on loop the music video that a fan made from said snippet. I listened to that one cover by George Barnett that went viral. I watched the clip from the Colbert Report where Stephen Colbert and a bunch of celebrities danced to it, which was made because Daft Punk were supposed to play on his show but weren't allowed to by MTV. I love this song dearly. I love the unique chord progression. I love Pharrell singing. I love Niall Rogers' guitar playing. I love how the beat gets more intense on the last chorus. I love the little synth part that plays in the outro. But honestly, the part I love most is this. How do I put this? Um... That one eight measure section is gonna be the vows I give at my wedding. To this day, one of my most favorite musical moments of any pop song. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, the album. The album is great. I know I just spent a good while complaining about this album getting memory hold, but I do believe it has stood the test of time. The opener, Give Life Back to Music, sets an epic stage for the rest of the album. Giorgio by Moroder features spoken word by the dance music legend, and in its eight minute runtime, it develops the synth hook into a sweeping orchestral epic. Don't forget that killer drum and bass solo, by the way. Shout out to Omar Hakim on drums. He sounds incredible. While it's not on the same level as Get Lucky, Pharrell's other collab, Lose Yourself to Dance, is a great time. I never get enough of those overlapping vocoders and how they pan from far left and far right into the center. Instant Crush is weird. Not in a bad way, it's just so random to have the Strokes' Julian Casablancas show up drenched in vocoding to sing about an unrequited relationship. Still a bop, though. And on the topic of weird, the last four songs feel like left turn after left turn. Motherboard is this gorgeous instrumental that feels like the soundtrack to stepping onto an alien world. Fragments of Time brings Todd Edwards back for vocal duties. I love the talk box solo in the bridge. Doing It Right with Panda Bear is the closest thing on here to a stereotypical Daft Punk song, and the closer contact features the only samples on the entire record, and it barrels into this massive build with, once again, Omar Hakim's phenomenal drumming. Oh, here's something really neat about this album structure. So the opener is in A minor, and the next two tracks are also in A minor. The fourth track within starts in A minor, but then shifts up to B flat minor. Then the next two tracks are also in B flat minor. Touch changes to B minor, which Get Lucky is also in. The rest of the album jumps between keys, but still a nice music theory nerd touch. And speaking of nerd touches, this thing sounds immaculate. If nothing else, Daft Punk made the definitive audiophile record of the 2010s. I can just hear every detail out of my Crosley turntable. The hype of random access memories may have died so hard that it now feels like a random access memory, but what's left is still a lovingly crafted homage to dance music of all decades. Ram gave Daft Punk the most critical and commercial attention they had ever seen. The album and Get Lucky got a ton of Grammys in 2014, and they even played it live with Pharrell, Nile Rodgers, and Stevie Wonder. No joke, this is the best Grammys performance of the past decade. Daft Punk interpolating their other big hits and Sheik's La Freak, the seamless transition into Stevie's Another Son, famous people of all generations dancing, whatever the hell Steven Tyler is doing here. This is one of those moments that reminds me how sick and cool and neat music can be. As one last piece of Ram, we got Daft Punk Get Lucky remix, which would end up being their final official release as a duo. It's fine. It doesn't even compare to the original, but more Get Lucky is never a bad thing. They produced a song on Pharrell's solo album from 2014. It's probably my favorite song off that record. Hey, this is looking like some robot rock, you know what I- But somehow that wasn't their most high profile collaboration after Ram, because what do you do after you've perfected writing bops for the weekend? writing bops for The Weeknd. In 2016, Daft Punk collaborated with The Weeknd on two tracks. The first, Starboy, is one that I've always been mixed on. It's a fine song, but if it weren't for that featuring Daft Punk on the song title, I would honestly forget that they worked on it. I am a much bigger fan of their second collab, I Feel It Coming. Looking back, this was The Weeknd's first time dabbling in 80s pop production, something he would do more and more with each passing record. In 2017, the robots joined The Weeknd to perform I Feel It Coming at the Grammys, 
Not on the same level as their Get Lucky performance, but still a good time. Though it's a shame that this would be Daft Punk's final live performance. After that, things were much quieter on the Daft Punk front. Toma produced some songs on Arcade Fire's Everything Now. Guy Manuel produced a song for The Weeknd's My Dear Melancholy EP. Their final producing work as a duo was the song Overnight by the Australian band Parcels. And in case you've been wondering why I've been saying this is the last thing they did or this is the final thing they did, well... February 22nd, 2021 the day I got a really bad burrito from Chipotle. On Daft Punk's YouTube channel, a new video was posted called Epilogue. It used a clip of the ending from Electroma, a graphic saying 1996 to 2021, and Guy Manuel walking off into the sunset. At the same time, Daft Punk's publicist announced that the duo had split up. There were no reasons given as to why the split happened, though Todd Edwards did confirm that it was amicable and mutual. Daft Punk ended things on their own terms, which is pretty in line for their whole career. The question you might ask is, why? Now, of course, without them explicitly telling us, there's no real way to know for sure. At first, I thought there was nowhere left for them to go, but Human After All proved that they can follow up a huge record with something more off-kilter and experimental. My personal thought is, I think they had just done everything they wanted to do. And while that might be a bummer to hear, I'm also happy for them. I'm happy that they closed out a career defined by following their instincts by following their instincts. All has been fairly quiet for both Guy Manuel and Thomas since the announcement. Though I doubt they're going to be sparking controversy now that they've hung up the helmets. The latest news about any solo projects was Thomas getting back into dance music. Ha! Ah! I am so funny! Will Daft Punk ever reunite? I ask because, seriously, not seeing Daft Punk live might top the list of my biggest regrets in life. But also, we live in a time when bands announce a breakup and then, for whatever reason, reunite a few years down the road. I once thought LCD sound system was done after 2011, and they just did a Christmas special for Amazon. Granted, Daft Punk have always done things with a strong artistic conviction, so this could genuinely be it for them. And if it is, and putting aside my own inability to ever see them again, they gave us a surprisingly diverse amount of quality music across just four main studio albums. The world is a marginally better place thanks to them and their music. If you want to get into Daft Punk, I would recommend starting out with Discovery and Random Access Memories. I would also highly recommend Alive 2007, but with the caveat that you should listen to their first three albums beforehand. And if you have a favorite Daft Punk song, album, related thing, I would love to know what it is in the comments. Oh,